Hey, thanks for joining us for PACT. I'm the P, Peter Coffin, the lovely Ms. Astronaut Cowboy Doctor, Master of Science here is the ACD. Put them together, that's PACT. You understand now, right? I don't yes. like that you've added that. <laughs> you don't like that I've added that? Do you want me not to do that? No, I'm just joking. I'm just <laughs> okay, joking. I'll keep it in. <laughs> don't miss an episode. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast service. Also, leave us a glowing review on Audible and Apple Podcasts. Help us keep the lights on by becoming a patron at our new Patreon, patreon.com slash packedpod. Um, your monthly support gets you into the Discord server, gets you exclusive content, and see some content before everyone else. There's also a rewards program uh, at the $35 tier where you get new merchandise every three months. Finally, please tell your friends we rely so big on word of mouth. So, so, so big. We stream 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday. Uh, pay attention to our Twitter account for links on that. Thanks a ton for tuning in. So, the kombucha mushroom people sitting around all day. Who can believe you? Who can believe you? Let your mother pray. Sugar. That's what we're talking about tonight. It's a tenuous reference. It's a tenuous reference that I absolutely had to do because that's me. And that song came out... 1998. Yeah. It was coloring. Funny. Coloring is what we're talking about today. Yeah. Color revolutions. Wow, it's all coming together. Yeah. We're going to start off with what's happening in Cuba right now. Um, Cubans are coming out in numbers like we've never seen before <laughs> um, to protest their undemocratic government. So first, what we're going to do... We're, we're going to give a little bit of a history about 20th century Cuba, kind of what's led up to this point. Then we're going to talk about color revolutions, um, which is where the United States helps out countries who need it to fight for democracy. Like there's a mass of people in a country that is saying, hey, America, we need some democracy help now. Yeah, and then a color revolution is when the United States, they empower them. Yeah, they, and, they uplift them. And and allow them to tell their stories. Yeah. And then, so after that, then we're, we're going to wrap it up, and this is the part that we'll probably spend the most time on, is talking about the current ideological reactions to that among self-identifying leftists and democracy lovers. Which includes some conservatives. Some big conservative organizations Who have that the ever... exact same fucking opinion. Yeah. As your socialist congressperson. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Let's go back to 1898. That's where we're going to start, eh? U.S. annexes Cuba. It's for sugar because that's the primary export of Cuba. Has always been, will always be, most Tenuous likely. Tenuous reference was there. Now you understand the system of down reference. Yeah. If you didn't before. So... U.S. annexed Cuba, wasn't really 100% sure whether or not they were going to make Cuba a colony. Um, over the next few years, that was an argument that went on. Cuba declared its independence in 1902. One of the conditions for the United States not resisting that was that Cuba allowed for an amendment in their constitution, which allowed for the U.S. to occupy them again, which is exactly what happened a few years later uh, when the U.S. invaded Cuba in 1906 and occupied them until 1909. This is the beginning of a pattern of behavior. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they definitely did that before in other areas. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, in <laughs> so, Cuba specifically. In Cuba specifically. For three decades, the country was led by a uh, series of presidents that ended in Gerardo Machado. We looked these things up because we knew that Peter would totally shit the bet on yeah. it. Just like entirely in very Midwestern Michigan for very your entire Michigan. life. Yeah. Uh, Machado was in power from 1925. The next thing that happened was the Great Depression. Great Depression caused sugar prices to plummet horrifically when uh, a gentleman by the name of Fulgencio Batista, oh. who had been building coalitions and power within the military, uh, did a military coup uh, and took over. The nation. Now, he didn't install himself as dictator, although he de facto ruled the country by declaring himself the head of the military. Cuba's economy was like 80 to 90 percent 
sugar based. And, mm-hmm. and so the Great Depression starting October 1929 causes sugar prices to plummet straight down. Almost, Almost 90% of the economy was halfway shut down. Yeah, exactly. And so that provided justification for Batista to stage his first military coup to assume power up until his own running in 1940, in which he won. He ran a populist platform, uh, economic populism, which he did not instate. Let's just go ahead and say it immediately. Yeah. Um, he ran the country for four years from that point. He went out of power in 1944, left for the United States, uh, took up residency in Daytona Beach, Florida, and did apparently nothing for about a decade. Um, what I think that he did for about a decade was build up connections with the U.S. government, with capital, with the, the mafia, because in the early 1950s, he went back down into Cuba, ran for president again uh, in the 1952 election. Uh, there was a three-way race. The incumbent was not part of the race, so the incumbent was already set on leaving anyways. Batista was third place in the polls, looked like he was going to lose pretty much resoundingly. So he was like, you know what? Let's do another military coup, guys. And then installed himself as dictator. And then installed himself as actual dictator. (laughs) When this happened, despite the Great Depression and kind of, you know, leading up to that point much earlier, when he came in, it was one of the most developed countries of the region, um, despite being very, very small in comparison to the U.S. They were doing pretty well in comparison to countries in the West, um, such as Italy, other countries in Western Europe. March 10th was the coup in 1952. The United States recognized that on March 27th. So less than three weeks. The U.S. justified him installing himself as dictator because of this drastic need for democracy everybody's starving everything's going to hell completely supported this corrupt brutal dictator the relationship between the u.s and batista is very very strong both legally with the united states government um, but also illegally in connections with criminal enterprises uh, working with two prominent members of the mafia um, to open up casinos and kind of funnel those funds through themselves in Casino Havana. Building. Yeah. <laughs> Havana was Las Vegas. So this is more than centuries long justification in Cuba for United States intervention um, for on behalf of brutal dictators around the world, around the world. That's the second system of the down reference during Batista's reign. So much of the country ended up being owned by U.S. citizens facilitated by the U.S. government. Earl E.T. Smith, who was the ambassador of the United States to Cuba, basically said that the United States ambassador to Cuba had a larger role in what went on for much of the time than Batista did. And he testified to that effect in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate. Up to that point, the United States owned 40 percent of Cuban sugar, 90% of mines and mineral concessions, and 80% of utilities, which is basically all oil at the point of the end of 1958 when the Cuban revolution happened. Um, That is how much investment and social and economic control that the United States had in Cuba. Which is fucking insane. During the lead up to the Cuban Revolution, Batista apparently pocketed around seven hundred million dollars in nineteen fifty two to fifty eight money. So explain about how much that is. It's about six point five billion dollars in today's money. Just made off with it from the Cuban Treasury. <laughs> so Cuban Revolution. Cuban Revolution happens. Um really what happened was there was a military coup. <laughs> they they did a military coup. Uh, and Castro and Che. Castro and Che did a military Which, coup. if you watch One Step at a Time, is just Yeah, that One Step horrifying. at a Time clip is just fucking insane. <laughs> what the hell are you wearing? Oh, Che Guevara? Yeah, Viva la Revolucion, am I right? It's like if you walked into a Jewish home wearing a Hitler shirt. It's, it's a show, I guess, about Miami Cubans. Is that is that true, uh, or am I just be. making that up? 
And they talk about how wearing a Che Guevara shirt is like wearing a Hitler shirt. Mm -hmm. But he has a cool hat. <laughs> U.S. initially recognized Castro's government, uh, but he kept doing Chad things, and they didn't like that. Because uh, like we said, the Virgin Batista, the, the Chad, Chad Castro. Fidel fucking Castro. Yeah. What happened uh, that really soured their relationship was... Castro repeatedly condemning the U.S. in his speeches about, you know, what the U.S. had been doing for the last 60 years. Yeah. Since <laughs> since 1898. You hate to see it. He specifically talked about those things that happened in the, the country. Condemned the United States for it. The U.S. didn't like that and withdrew support of Castro. He also went ahead and nationalized a shitload of property. That was One point, owned by United yeah. States citizens. The, you know, the property we were just talking about. He, he fucking nationalized it. Again, in 1960, money. $1.5 billion. Only about double, like, the amount of money a single corrupt dictator divested from the yeah, country. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty fucking insane. Yeah. <laughs> Besides nationalizing that, calling out the U.S. on their 60 years of bullshit, I was like, you know what really pissed those bitches off? Yeah. If we got cozy with the Soviets. During the Cold War. <laughs> yeah, during the Cold during the height of the Cold War. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cuba became a, like the hot button issue during the Kennedy versus Nixon election. You referenced that already a little bit, but Yeah, when I was talking about the proportion of United States investment and in these different like large natural resource industries in Cuba. That was JFK speaking while running for president mm -hmm. um, and using Cuba as like this this pivotal issue off of which probably said to have won JFK the election. Yeah. Um, or at least Nixon says that. Nixon thinks that he lost it due to Cuba. And also, just to be clear, like the type of rhetoric that JFK was using was along the lines of, oh, of course they overthrew uh batista of course he's a bad dude like corn pop yeah <laughs> despite the fact that batista was cozy with the u.s the u.s was very cozy with him capital was very cozy with batista i mean the joe biden was probably cozy with corn pop at be, some yeah, point you're probably not wrong at some points in their life probably not wrong batista also made communism illegal like he outlawed the communist party so i mean in a very funny satirical way <laughs> Castro overthrew the entire country, <laughs> calling himself a humanist instead of a communist. Because, you know, if you're outwardly a communist and that's illegal, that's a problem. It's so true. Also, the Trotskyites were all like, how could a revolution happen in Cuba? There were no Marxists. How could this backwards? Country? Yeah, this backwards. Word, but... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, in 1961, our man Fidel Castro Declared himself a Marxist-Leninist. And, and, what? Yeah. <laughs> so that was in 1961. In um, 1986, the New York Times decided to prove that Castro was a communist. Which is great. <laughs> Which is, that's, that's fucking so hilarious. Awesome. I mean, I'm not going to get into it. I just wanted to throw that up because it it's says, funny. It says, Fidel shit. Castro's years as a secret communist, October 19th, 1986. <laughs> Got him. Got him. So uh, during the uh, Eisenhower administration, the CIA began plotting to overthrow Castro. Literally, like right away, it was like 1961. They decided we gotta get this guy out of power. This is bad. He declared himself a Marxist-Leninist. He was like, "You guys have been fucking around in our country for 60 years. Not cool. Hey, Soviets, you're badass." Yeah, during the Cold War yeah. again, the height of the Cold War. Eisenhower was like, "Let's let's get rid of this guy. We gotta get yeah. rid of this guy." <laughs> Uh, so the CIA began plotting. They put a plot into action in order to overthrow him through... Uh, they did the Bay of Pigs. Yeah, they did the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> That's really what we're leading up to. Which, if you're unaware, was a invasion, which was not the United States at all, guys, seriously. With over 1,400 paramilitaries who were like Cuban exiles who had been trained by the U.S. military and the CIA to invade. Which, by the way, it was a thing that the CIA planned and Kennedy approved and then was like, hey, guys, we can't have the appearance of this being us. 
It's it's Cuban exiles, man. Miami Cubans. To avoid the, the, the new version of Carlos. <laughs> yeah, the, the new Square version of Carlos. His parents were slave owners. Yeah. And said, Castro's evil, man. Take that Che Guevara shirt off. Yeah. It's like, you're a Nazi. It's yeah, like, you fucking like, Nazi. You red brown alliance, bitch. Yeah. It's like if you walked into a Jewish home wearing a Hitler shirt. So it was originally planned to be an invasion of Trinidad, but to avoid the appearance of American involvement, Kennedy asked that it was... Uh, through the Bay of Pigs, which lost it for them, basically. Right. <laughs> they were so concerned with it looking like a, a U.S.-led operation that they fucked it up <laughs> in order to avoid it. And they didn't avoid it. Amateurs. So, to sum up, sugar, it's a really important thing that Cuba does a lot with. The United States had control of it in one way or another for about six decades, starting at the turn of the century. The Great Depression failures in the sugar industry justified a lot of the corruption that happened in the government in the 1930s, 40s. Which the U.S. government and U.S. capital supported and benefited from. And then that was all brought to a screeching halt by Giga Chad Fidel Castro in 1958. And since then, they've been trying to get rid of this guy. He died a couple years ago. Yeah, totally different guy down there. As of this year... People are really rising up to fight yeah, for their rights. True. Which that can bring us to defining what a color revolution is. Color revolutions. We're gonna bring back our friend Caleb Maupin. The way that Caleb defines this, this is just through conversations with him. We think of color revolutions as an uprising staged by the Imperial Corps. So the United States, the West, whatever, people who control capital. To justify a neoliberal coup, often in the context of breaking down socialist or communist projects. And this has been especially true in Eastern European countries like Georgia, Serbia. Uh, these are all places where the United States has been involved in directly funneling and funding these revolutions against these oppressive communist post-Soviet governments. Made for TV uprisings. Yeah. Yeah. Made for TV uprisings. The way that Caleb talks about these, what text is this from? City this Builders? is from City Builders. Okay. So he talks a little bit about color revolutions in the context of his concept of the synthetic left, um, which, if you were here last week, if you've read his book, um, or if you just know a little bit about the history of the left, kind of starting with the 1960s and this sort of new left era. Um, within which the CIA was also involved in the Congress for Cultural Freedom, directing leftists away from specifically delineated Marxist principles and seizing the means of production, abolishing profit motive, things like that, into this new left kind of hippie freedom, sort of almost like classical liberal yeah. democratic values under the guise of revolutionary mm -hmm. aesthetics to deviate these folks away from class struggle. What we're seeing in the left today and what Caleb would call the synthetic left today is emergent from these trends that mm -hmm. had United States capital roles in misdirecting leftist attention from communistic goals. And again, this is during the Cold War. So individuals, young highly educated college activists. It, during, sometimes students, sometimes right. faculty, sometimes artists, etc. Right. Are are coming together and, and feeling like and, and this is because like these socialist and communist projects do kind of crack down in a more conservative way during this time because they're trying to prevent counter revolution. Yeah. Um, you have the and, Imperial core constantly at your throat. Right. So that that's not to say that like the failures of these projects are, are good or justifiable, whatever. No. Um, but they're a reaction to prevent counter revolution. I mean, if you read Lenin, this is like a very critical part of those initial phases of a proletarian state. And, and so these highly educated activist identifying people start 
protesting vaguely for freedom. They don't think they're protesting against socialism or communism, but they just want freedom. They don't want to be stifled. Freedom is the magic word. And the United States is obviously very supportive of this because it's during the Red Scare, essentially. Anything that can be used to weaken any opponent of quote-unquote U.S. democracy. I mean, Caleb provides a lot of great context on um, color revolutions in his book, City Builders. We'll include the link in the show notes. Another uh, paper, it's a fantastic summary of like the critical view of what a color revolution is. It's called Color Revolutions, Democratization, Hidden Influencer Warfare. And it defines color revolutions as a nonviolent mass protest aimed at changing the existing quasi-democratic governments through elections. It also immediately says it can be questioned whether or not a color revolution is really a revolution because the concept of revolution includes claims for the creation of a new socio-political order and color revolutions are largely limited to changing the political elite within the existing system. So I'm directly quoting from here. The critique of color revolutions is based on the perspective of a geopolitical struggle according to which it is a Western tool for broadening and strengthening global influence. Such view is rooted in the fact that the unifying ideology of color revolutions is just blanket democracy, which is a fundamental political value of the West. By promoting its political model, the West can also increase its influence globally. Now, I'm not going to repeat everything in here, but uh, it, it does a lot documenting exactly how the United States are very clearly doing exactly the same types of stuff that they did to support Batista, except for without explicit military action. So critical view of color revolutions is rooted in the recognition that the United States has an extensive history of interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Which we kind of just talked about. In Cuba specifically, Cuba. which is why that history was important. Doubts about the true intentions of Western promotion of democracy and operations for the protection of human rights in foreign countries are strengthened by now generally recognized fact that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was a war for oil, but was officially communicated as a war for disarming Iraq of weapons of mass destruction, ending terrorism and freeing the Iraqi people. <laughs> Such a fatal discrepancy between words and deeds not only weakens the position of the West, but it works in favor of its adversaries. Color revolutions are carried out according to a certain pattern which was present in almost all cases, show a high degree of foreign involvement. The most obvious indicator of a foreign presence is the funding that the West has provided in these protest movements. In the bulldozer revolution in Serbia, there was $64 million. The Rose Revolution in Georgia was about $525,000. The Orange Revolution in the Ukraine was more than $35 million. And in the context of talking about uh, the Ukraine, Victoria J. Nuland, the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs at the time of the writing of this paper, had admitted that since 1991, which is probably further than the scope of the studies, uh, but since 1991, the U.S. has invested more than $5 billion in the Ukraine for the quote-unquote development of democracy. So you might be asking, well, how do they give them this money? Yeah. Well, they do it through transnational organizations such as the United States Agency for International Development. That's USAID, the National Endowment for Democracy, NED, NED, the George Soros Open Society Institute, which everybody wonders about George Soros funding communism. He actually funds the, uh, the dismantling of it. Yeah. Just so people know. Very pro-American, that George Soros. One more thing from this paper I want to bring up, the role of Western media in a color revolution. The role of Western media also has to be mentioned as an important influential factor that constructed the desired picture of reality and helped mobilize mass protesters. The post-Soviet color revolutions took place before the boom of social media, but the Arab Spring mass riots that flared up in Tunisia and took over Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Algeria, Jordan, Oman, Kuwait, and other countries in the following year played a significant role as mass mobilization tools during the protests in the Middle East and Northern Africa. That's why social media has also been mentioned as a contributing factor in color revolutions. 
What's important to mention, I think, further is that they manufacture the consent for those revolutions internally. Anything that the U.S. does uh, involved in these things, uh, politicians showing support, uh, the administration offering aid, et cetera, et cetera. The U.S. media paints that stuff as like a reaction to it and therefore shows it as this spontaneous thing that is just happening in some other place. An uprising made for TV. Yeah. Basically, a lot of that is learning the lesson from the Bay of Pigs. It looked bad. Supposed to be a covert operation. It wasn't. It involved the U.S. military, the CIA. It was an international embarrassment. Another big lesson the U.S. learned was Vietnam. Yeah. Really didn't help. So uh, they, Also Korea. Also beforehand. Korea. So the color revolution strategy is really something that was developed as a means to enact those types of things, like topple certain elites in favor of other elites who are going to be more favorable to U.S. interests. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate thing here. Oftentimes it was to topple a communist in favor of pro-capitalist. So where does that bring us today? We saw mass protests in the streets of Cuba. Check out this video from PragerU of the mass protests in the streets of Cuba. My polycule. And my early 20s was larger than this. <laughs> Seriously, it was. It, it, was a, it was a national enterprise. Oh. So, first off, I want to say that we are not accusing these people of being CIA agents. That is just explicitly not what we're doing. All we are saying is that we're seeing Cubans rise up and protest for their rights like never before. That's not what we're actually saying. That's actually what um, AOC. Prager U said about the... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. It's AOC. It's, it's AOC. Socialist Congresswoman AOC. Yeah. Said that in public and condemned the undemocratic actions of their communist leader in Cuba. Yeah, yeah. That is what AOC said, isn't it? And, you know... You're telling me this isn't Dennis Prager? She not only said it, but she also deleted it off of her 12 million follower yeah. account and then posted it on her representative account, which only has like 600,000 followers on it. Got way less flack there. Let's just be completely clear. If your first tweet is, we see the Cubans rise up and protest for the rights like never before. We stand in solidarity with them, condemn the undemocratic actions led by President Diaz Canal. That's the first one. The rest of it is after the first. Everyone knows the first tweet gets the most engagement. Yeah. The point is to put forward that, not everything else. The anti-communist project. We need the Miami Cubans to know we're on their side. Yeah. The Batista government that Fidel Castro overthrew, the Miami Cubans, a lot of them are the descendants of or the actual people who fled because that bitch was overthrown. By the way, these are probably some of the same people that AOC claimed tried to murder her on January 6th. Oh, yes. Um, Anti-communist Cuban folks were a big part of that protest. And now we see people like that one person who is at the protest and complaining about how seeing all the Trump hats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. After the first tweet, which is the one the vast majority of people saw, she goes on to talk more about the suppression of media speech and protests, blah, 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 which strangely enough, all communications are down and yet somehow everybody's posting on Twitter. Then she brings up the embargo. The very last tweet in the thread, she says, I strongly reject the Biden administration's defense of the embargo. It's never acceptable for us to use cruelty as a leverage point against everyday people. What AOC said is essentially, hey, it's great that this color revolution is happening. <laughs> also, the embargo is bad. Pretty bad. Yeah. And we condemn that. And let's just go ahead and say this. The communist Cuban government, the reason the embargo exists, unless that goes away, the United States will not be lifting that embargo. So when AOC says we condemn the embargo, it is an empty statement entirely. All that is 
is her knowing that leftists don't like the embargo. So she says the embargo is bad. It's not going to be lifted. She knows it's not going to be lifted. It's full on straight pandering. It sounds like it's terrible that we have to have this embargo. Yeah, I mean, this un- anti-democratic government, we can't lift that because then we're supporting. Yeah, because then we're communists. supporting this horrible communist government. That's hurting its people that we're hurting by this embargo. Yeah. Um, this government that chooses to remain communist. Well, some leftists will say that they're not protesting the government. They'll say that they're protesting the conditions uh, caused by the embargo, caused by COVID, in, in interacting with the embargo, what have you. Um, and the reason that those exist is because of the United States intervention in Cuba for anti-communist purposes. So, again, just like what Peter said. But whether you're intentionally or not, you're saying, like, it's good that these people are protesting. We need to support these protesters. When it's a very obvious color revolution type thing going on, which we have tons of historical precedent for, tons of historical precedent for the United States interfering in Cuba in ways that they are trying to overthrow this government, which more or less ended 60 years of unfettered like exploitation of this country and its resources. The main thing that self-identifying leftist communists but who are pro-imperial core narrative are doing um, is trying to take a both sides approach. Bosch, uh, specific example. Why, yes, I do oppose destructive American sanctions and also support Cubans demanding more from their government. How could you tell? Uh, I mean, the it, second part undercuts the first part. Of exactly. It. And again, the same people that Vosh in this specific example said need to be disappeared. You have a video of um, Caleb. There, there are people demonstrating in New York, New York, um, who he literally went up to them and asked them. Like, hey, what what are you protesting for? Is this is this an antagonism to the embargo? And they said no, embargo is okay. Um, we're protesting against communism. Do you want to end the blockade, the sanctions against Cuba? I'm sorry. Do you want to end the blockade, the sanctions? No, end the sanction. No. Why not? We want end, no, we want to end the communism. So the Cuba, go, Cuba the blockade the keeps people from getting medicine. Freedom, freedom, freedom. 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 Do you know she said the magic word freedom there? Mm. <laughs> so you're supporting that, yeah. Bosch. Yeah. They don't give a shit about the embargo. They don't give a shit about it. All they care about is bringing down communism. So you have these supposedly anti-establishment leftists softening people's views towards the protesters, which are very likely a color revolution. But straw manning actual communists saying that we're saying every single person is a, a CIA operative. Which no, no, we just acknowledge that these people are informed by ideology. They Color just... revolutions clearly aren't CIA agents doing protest movements. They're various forms of aid and support uh, helping along naive people who want more freedom. freedom. And who have been affected by the past several decades of ideology, of even leftism. I mean, these people are right wingers who are protesting yeah, absolutely. Cuba right now. Um, and, and, you know, you'll see us talk about legitimate reasons for right wingers to protest in the United States. And we usually say that the conditions that lead to this are because of misguiding ideologies that led them to, in our opinions, come to the wrong conclusions. Mm -hmm. Same thing happening here. But the individuals who are self-identifying leftists who are supporting this in the United States are being informed by decades of like directly CIA impacted knowledge um, or shared knowledge among the new left. Look at the CIA report on the Bay of Pigs after the fact. Yeah. That yeah. is some red pilling shit. Yeah. <laughs> Biden. <laughs> Biden has called Cuba a failed state and called communism a universally failed system. So if you're condemning Biden for the embargo and asking him to lift it, that's who you're dealing with. The current Cuban president, Miguel Diaz Canel, responded to Biden by saying, if President Joe Biden really had humanitarian concerns for the Cuban people, he would eliminate the 243 measures applied by President Donald Trump, including 50 imposed cruelly during the pandemic. Essentially, 
Biden's continuing Trump's policies in Cuba. And if AOC really cared about the embargo in Cuba, she could have said something done. much earlier. But we we were too busy making sure that Medicare for all didn't get passed. Yeah, yeah, AOC was doing that, wasn't she? Also, if we're interested in President Diaz Canel, this man has been in the Communist Party since the early nineties, was an advocate for LGBT rights when many people in the province frowned upon homosexuality as president. He has reformed the presidency so that it can only be occupied for two consecutive five-year terms. He's also banned discrimination based on disability, gender, gender identity, race, and sexual orientation. It's stuff that AOC claims to be for in a lot of cases, like socialism. That's a big one. For two, uh, a lot of uh, rights for marginalized groups. Seems like that's a lot of the stuff that AOC claims to be about. Socialism it and that. It does. But now I'm here. Did she say God hates fans? <laughs> I don't know. Is it AOC or is it Dennis Prager? Like, that's kind of I the don't new, know. We're, that's kind of the, the new question. This is the of the day. They're literally equating communism with, like, taking away your freedoms. They're, they're my Trump-supporting mother. Yeah, absolutely. And you cannot distinguish AOC's opinion from that of my mother in this situation, which is bad. So when you see... Bosch, the serfs, Bernie Sanders. Oh, Bernie has been insufferable about this. When you see any of these people being like, oh, don't call us CIA plants, or we need to support the protesters, even though the embargo is bad, we need to support the protesters. Understand what they're doing. They're saying it's okay to undermine the communist government of Cuba. And if you can't tell the difference between AOC and Prager you, <laughs> AOC isn't what a lot of people think she is. Yeah. Bosch isn't what a lot of people think he is. The serfs aren't what a lot of people think he is. Bernie fucking Sanders is not what a lot of people think he is. If you want communism long term, and I'm not saying that I can guarantee that's going to happen in our lifetimes or at all. I don't know. I really don't know. But if you want that stuff, you have to understand this stuff is an obstacle. It's a direct hindrance to communism because communism has to happen on the worldwide stage. Imperialism has to be resisted. It cannot be allowed. It can't be supported. We have to band together against this shit. We have to show solidarity to these small countries, even though these small countries have problems. And they fail. They do. It happens. And especially when you have the fucking global superpower trying to stage counter-revolutions in your socialist projects constantly. They are in that phase of socialism where that is going to happen. Well, I can hear the response now, though. But they've shipped in the Overton window so far. I don't... What did AOC do for the Overton window that is important if she's misdirecting all people who identify as leftist or socialist or communist to support the U.S. Imperial Corps? I, I am so tired of the Overton window. I, am also, I don't give a fuck about that. I also. Because all it's just people thinking that they're more leftist and more communist -er and more socialist -er than they actually are with completely no attention to class struggle. Well, the Overton window is taking politics and converting it to something that is measurable. It's metricizing politics. You're adding more left points. That's all you're doing. And that's not real. That's not how politics works. It's not real because what is AOC doing in terms of her material impact? The same thing that all the establishment Democrats did when they voted Nancy Pelosi back in. Well, exactly. Like, you can say, I'm against the embargo in Cuba, but you're not for the government that the embargo is intending to weaken. We cannot care about what AOC or what Bernie Sanders, what Vosh or what the serfs or any of these people have done for left politics via moving the Overton window. Stop falling for shit. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching. This is Pact. I'm Peter. This is Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor. To help us out, click like, follow, subscribe, whatever. Leave us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Audible. To support us, become a patron at patreon.com slash Peter Coffin. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you later.